Alright, welcome back everyone. Premiere episode number 10, after a long hiatus. So I'm back here with James, we uh, finally got some time to sit down and bring you guys some content. It's been long overdue, we had a long dark winter. Um, it's, been a, it's been a long time, hasn't it? It uh, feels like a lifetime ago now. Yeah. Absolutely. That, that's what happens with life, though, right? Things get in the way, you're tested. And uh, like the old saying, if you love it, let it go. If it returns, it's yours. That kind of, you know. And here we are. We've stuff. returned. Like it or not, we're back. And, <laughs> you know, I, yeah, it's, I think, when, when did we leave off? It was August, I think, right? Yeah, I think about six, seven months ago was the last episode we did with um, a gentleman named Benjamin it was, uh, he wrote the book, The Buddha and the Wolf. So if you guys are tuning in now, I would suggest go back to episode one. Nothing's really sequential or in succession, you know what I mean? But uh, other than uh, we had a couple episodes, The End of All Evil, that one should definitely listen to right from the beginning all the way to the end to kind of get the whole grasp of that book. And then uh, we had Underworld Part 1 and Part 2. But other than that, just, uh, yeah, check out the last episode we had with Benjamin. Yeah. Yeah. So what's, what's been going on, man? What's, what's happening? Let's give, let's give the audience some updates. Yeah. So nothing horrible happened at all. Life just, uh, happened. I quit my job back in November. So mm-hmm. not that it matters, but I'm a tradesman plumber, right? And, uh, Got my license, finished up the apprenticeship, obviously a while ago, and just finally made the conscious choice to start working for myself. After all the talk of sovereignty and do things for yourself, and all the uh, the fanciful wish, you know, wishful thinking of being fully responsible for yourself, your life, your monetary situation, food, even all that stuff, it was like I had to make a change. It was just killing my soul, showing up every day working for a giant corporation that I fucking hated. Um, mostly hated it because everything was given to me. Super comfortable, right? Show up, you know, you're going to get 40 hour paycheck every week without a doubt. You can call in sick a thousand times. It didn't matter. Right. So it was too comfortable. Mm-hmm. I noticed uh, patterns in my life that were following suit. So I was way too comfortable with making money for a corporation and, uh, I got lazy, obviously, right? Just patterns. So mm-hmm. I finally made the choice to quit and, uh, started up a business with a longtime business partner. Uh, he actually was my journeyman. So I learned plumbing from this guy and we, uh, we got together and basically said, fuck it. Didn't really have a plan. Uh, fuck, didn't have, you know, a shit ton of money to hold us, uh, hold us afloat just in case quote unquote things failed and we just went for it. So I've been, uh, full time. I mean, I work a stupid amount mm-hmm. for now and it's a good thing, right? I'm pouring my heart and soul, blood and tears into this to, uh, make sure I'm financially stable by my own hands because you can't ever hold a deep feeling that, you know, some, this, this corporation's too big to fail. These, this company will never fail. They'll, they'll never let me go. They'll never fire me. Like that shit happens all the time. People, uh, now, yeah. Oh yeah. People have worked for, for companies for like 30 years and like, Oh, you know what? Time to go. Here's a, a shitty pension. You're gone. Right. And they will hire whatever, you know, the, uh, the mass immigration that's happening in Canada, they'll just hire somebody for pennies on the dollar to do the, your exact same job. I think they call it a diversity hire now, but yeah, there wasn't, I wasn't going to wait for that. And, uh, what really kind of kicked me into gear was the company that I worked for was a place where plumbers go to die. Like I said, it was so easy. It was unbelievably comfortable. So all these guys would just every day that they all be talking about their pension or I'm going to save up. I'm going to be retired by 60. And I'm like, Holy fuck. Like you're just basically planning your funeral. 
basically what the yeah. hell's what the hell's the point of living there was no thought after that right and I was you like, know, when you said that, me. I actually, I actually shuddered. I shuddered in, inside that that mentality because I've been so far removed from it for such a long time. And it's uh, the safe route. Yeah, it's leads into the book that we're going to be talking about, uh, learning how to shudder again. And when you said that, the retirement and you know, only forty years left of this. You know, every day is hell, but at least I'll be finished and. And then I'll then I'll really put my feet up or whatever, right? It's uh, I, I shuddered. I was just like, oh fuck! Like, and you wonder what that's generational because it's been like that. That was instilled in me as a young child, or right? even before yeah. I got into the workforce at like fifteen, you know, fourteen, fifteen years old. I was taught find a job, safe, get a paycheck every week, and uh, you know, save up. You want something nice, save up for it. You know, but there was no ever teaching of do what you love find something you truly want to master a craft a skill uh you know a technical job and just love it make sure you love it there was none of that right so i grew up following that path of just take the safe route and i know a lot of people are taught that i know a lot of people are still struggling with that because it gets to a point where you're 10, 15, 20 years into a career, a job, anything like that. And you've built your life up mortgage, you know, car payments, children, all these things. And it's really hard to take that leap of faith into, I'm going to call it sovereignty. I call it sovereignty for my own path. Um, you know, I still have to, I'm still technically running a company, right? So I'm, it's not like I'm, um, running drugs or do, you know, whatever it may be, where it's like, oh, there's no, no rules, right? No, there's still <laughs> very much things you have to follow, right? Anarchist plumbing. We yeah, make it up yeah. as we go. Exactly. No, I'm, I know that anarchy, I'm just, uh, it's, a, it's a phrase, right? But um, just no, imag- imagine that, right? No, but enough about no, me, man. You've no been rules. on adventures. What's been, been up with couple, you? Yeah. Well, since... Yeah, since we last did the podcast, I was staying in Quebec, and I just knew that the time there was up. Uh, I, I just remember not being able to sleep. I was just kind of tossing and turning. I've never been to Europe before. And I always wanted to go to Norway. That was my number one spot if I was to travel somewhere um, in Europe. So that was the first destination that I went to. Went there. That seems such a long, it seems like such a long time ago now too. Came back for about a month and said, you know, I could go back to Europe, went back to Europe, came back and then went back again. And now I'm back again. Um, I feel like that phase is over as well. This uh, exploration chapter, I do plan to relocate there long term, but I felt uh, I felt finished with with the explorations that I was doing, at least for now. Um, that's How is the of difference it. between Canada and here, or sorry, uh, Europe and Canada? Because I know we had a conversation before about uh, the things we see here on government buildings and the billboards and like the flags of other countries. So, what was your take on uh, the way Europe's going? Depends on where you go. I think in North America we get a skewed vision of what Europe is. Usually we, we get scenes from France, Paris, or London as kind of what Europe is, but it's, it's not that way. I mean, if you go to the major cities, it might be, but I was in Dublin, beautiful place, beautiful city. Um, same as uh, like Bergen in Norway. I was in Glasgow. You start getting into any city, it's going to look kind of the same, 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 but different in a sense. Uh, but there still is a lot of rural communities, a lot of, um, I'll call it ethnic singularity, or um, just people living on the land that is theirs and, and just kind of living within a small community, especially in northern Spain. That place blew my mind. Uh, I didn't even, I didn't know much about Spain at all. I just kind of went. And northern Spain, 
was probably the most remarkable and the most grounded place that I that I went to in Europe actually. I was quite surprised by that. Uh, a lot of mountains, a lot of fresh air, a lot of ocean, obviously, along the coast. And uh, just the way of life is completely different. You, you, you sense it in, in Spain. They have the siesta. There's not, there's not a big push on the career and just balls to the wall uh, chasing money. I mean, um, we talk about... Uh, you know, drinking natural spring water and organic beef and organic food and, and everything like that. Well, that's just how they live over there. It's it's kind of, uh, I mean, that's just the way that I think that we're, we're intended to live. I, the the best, best parts of Europe that I saw were northern Spain. Very uh, Sounds like my kind of place. <laughs> yeah. And slow, too, with the siesta. You You eat kind of a big lunch, and then between one and four, one and five, it's done. It's everything's closed down. Good. Like you're not going to be able to buy anything unless it's like gas or, or whatever. And it's just, it's really chill. It's a really chill place. Yeah. It's like every um, day, every day. Yeah. Siesta. Oh my God. I would love that. Have a, have a nap right after lunch. Fuck. Sign me up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I explored a lot of the, um, Neolithic paleolithic sites. That was kind of the main interest interest there's yeah i mean there's a lot to get into with that maybe well at another podcast i'll probably present some of the findings in a cohesive manner so that's that's mainly what i've been up to kind of traveling back and forth going there nice yeah yeah i definitely want to uh check out some ancient sites really feel the energy there and I mean, especially with studying Velikovsky and all these other catastrophe theorists. I mean, mm-hmm. there's some connections to uh, take a look at for sure. You really do feel it. Um, maybe not immediately. I don't think it's an immediate thing. It sort of it lingers. It kind of, if you allow it to, you kind of allow that to kind of seep into yourself. And uh, it, it just kind of changes you slowly. Like it, there's more questions than answers when you visit these sites. And that those questions is kind of what fuels the investigation. Did you see any uh, proof or indication of like catastrophe, like back in uh, like what Commons Beaumont was talking about and anything <clears> like <throat> that? The stuff that Tessarion talks about? Yeah, I think that... Uh, there used to be a place called Doggerland. It's a theory. I don't think it's a theory, but basically in between Norway, Scotland, and uh, North Europe, like Netherlands area, used to be a landmass. And then that actually sunk. Um, and you kind of you kind of see that. You kind of when I was on Orkney Island, it felt like there was a catastrophe there. They found like a Viking village. It was buried under. Um, sand essentially. A lot of the, a lot of these monuments that they find in Europe are actually buried under layers and layers of dirt. They haven't been sitting there. They've been rediscovered in the 17 and 1800s. Uh, it just goes to show how much has been covered up, not just psychically, our our psyche, but also physically. They probably go hand in hand. There's probably a, a reflection and a relationship there as well. So the ancient world really is covered in dirt. And and sand and and catastrophe as well as as well as our psyche and our connection to it. So I think with these ancient sites, I think it's it's very important to go and, and travel to them and kind of um. You really do connect back to that that timelessness or the this this ancient sort of state of mind. I I see the evidence of a catastrophe kind of everywhere. Um. But to pinpoint it and, and say specifics, I, it's hard to say. Yeah. I mean, it gives new meaning to the phrase unearthing trauma, right? It's covered in dirt, unearthing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the New Grange, for example, I think was rediscovered in the 18 or 1900s. And this is one of the biggest uh, megalith monuments in, in Britain. 
And it's only been in public consciousness for about 200 years to put in context. It was just buried. It was buried under mountains. It was a farmer's field, essentially. A lot of these, it was uh, some stories in Orkney Island, some of the locals told me, um, you know, a farmer was drunk and went wandering off into his field and his leg slipped down a chamber. And then, you know, and then there you go. You got uh, uh, a, a passage tomb all of a sudden, right? So it's it's very fascinating. It's actually been a common thread. I think there's a few of them. The oldest, uh, I'm going to butcher the name, Gobekli Tepe, was the same yeah. thing. It was a sheep herder or a sheep farmer. And uh, I can't remember what happened, but basically he unearthed it and he was like, oh, what's this stone? And the next thing you know, it's like the oldest uh, known, you know, monolithic structure or site. Mm-hmm. And we're like, holy fuck. And that's in so, Turkey, right? Yeah. So out there, thank your uh, local drunk farmers for finding archaeological finds. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. They're like yeah, the, uh, so- the Freuds and the Carl Jungs of the material world. Mm-hmm. And, and that sort of buried in dirt goes hand in hand with the, the book that we're going to be getting into, this idea of the wild man being buried under water and and mud deep in the dense forest that we've in modern times we just keep getting more and more away from but that archetypal energy of the wild man is uh is actually the energy that we need in these times because it is the primitive masculine that's so very missing in in modernity, I mean, all you have to do is take a look around. Yeah, between the corporate world, the clean shaven, sanitized man that uh, seems to be everybody's attacking, right? But uh, not realizing it's a product of our own doing, right? Straying away from that, like you said, that primordial masculine, not the savage man, which everybody thinks. You know, the savage, the rapist, the, uh, the warmongering, just savage individual, but the actual primal energy of what it means to be a masculine figure, the, the real man, not, uh, yeah, what the priest would call the, the, the flock, right? Somebody that who would just step in line, lockstep mm-hmm. with fuck the sanitized man. Which unfortunately, I mean, I'm back in more of a, a, a workspace that there is a lot of guys like that. And most of them are engineers, sadly to say, you know, not the guys getting their hands dirty every day on a job site, but the ones who believe they are God's gift to humanity because they can use AutoCAD and uh, think up plans that in reality don't ever work. Right. It's always the people who are down, dirty, understanding how to use the tools, how reality functions that are truly kind of unearthing, I guess, how to be a man. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think, I think that it does come down and come, it comes down to the heart and kind of sinking. It is painful. Like this work is painful. I've been th- I've been through a lot of this now, especially the past year. It it takes this, and and an Iron Johnny talks about this uh, a will to go down, and going down is going within yourself, and you will pass through all these um, traumas, wounds whether they're personal or archetypal, you kind of realize that they're all kind of the same is that they're this, you know, your life story is actually kind of a fractal of mythological time in a sense. Um, So I think that without heart, without this, uh, the centeredness, if it's just purely mind and engineering I mean, engineering, you can just design more and more complex computational systems and AI structures and 
super prisons and fucking super weapons. And you're just circling around. You're, you're just circling away. You're, you're getting away actually from the center of things. This primal masculine sacred energy, you're, you're propelling yourself away from it. You don't want to look at it. We've evolved now. We've evolved from that. Blah, blah, blah. We're going to be uh, on spaceships and stuff now. We're going to Mars. We're going to be elf-like aliens. And uh, there's going to be no more dirt. There's going to be no more fucking pain. It's, it's, we're blasting away from, from the truth of reality, I think. We're blasting away from the truth of our past. And the past is that we were primal at one point. And we can still connect to it and we must connect to it we have to we have to connect to the primacy of nature or it's fucking over that's just that's the way i see it so it's basically the running away of uh introspection right the the deep understanding of self versus the uh the outward projection we think we are yeah. So yeah. that that to me that I mean that'll that'll manifest into like you said rocket ships and trying to blow ourselves out into the universe. But that won't ever happen when your psyche's still damaged because you're just going to bring along all that fucking garbage that's locked away. Mm-hmm. So it's unfortunate that psychology and psychoanalysis has basically been uh even though it's still in its you know it's in its infancy. It's been put to the wayside. It's never really been deeply looked at other than obvious, you know, the, the psychoanalysis, uh, sorry, psychoanalyst, Carl Jung, Freud, you know, the German idealist There's a few, that's a pin drop of, you know, the size of humanity, but studying their works really gets down to the nitty gritty of solving everything that everybody is screaming about. Whether it's you go on Twitter, you know, talk to your crazy conspiracy theorist uncle about the issues <laughs> of the world. It's it's Joe Biden. It's fucking it's it's the Jews. Listen, I get it. But there's a reason we do the things we do. There's a reason we say the things we say. There's a reason we do the things we don't want to do continuously. And over and over and over again. And there's answers. Just nobody wants to take a look at it because they want somebody else to be like, hey, that's what's wrong with you. Here's a book. Here's a pill. You know, here's my, uh, subscribe to my podcast, northernwolvespodcast.com. Right. But you know, anything like that, it's always an external savior. Mm-hmm. when in truth it'll never happen i'm telling you right now never is going to happen things will not get fixed until every single human being shuts the fuck up and starts looking within themselves hey man i just watched dune and there is an external savior and he's gonna fix it he's called him the, the madi <laughs> <laughs> But around. again, right? It was it was no. seated by the Benny Jesuits, the Jesuits, right? No, so yeah, <laughs> no, no. I I know what you're saying. Uh, I just find find it remarkable that this movie is is in the public consciousness now. It's related exactly kind of to what you're talking about. That's why I bring it up. That was a great fucking movie. Yeah. So you've been you've been reading a lot lot of. Uh, I saw the what you've been posting on Twitter, a lot of young Freud. What other material? Um that's kind of been the the main focus since the last podcast for you. I can tell you I've probably other than finishing the Hiram key, finally, um, I haven't read more than a fucking chapter or two since. That's mm-hmm. how unbelievably I want to say dedicated, but I made it no choice to do this material route, right? Very grounded route of, uh, again, I'm going to call it sovereignty, but no, this is, it's just been, uh, picking up excerpts, you know, um, 
really just kind of remembering the things that I've read before. So I'm trying to like recall things that I've read to kind of go over it again in my head, but fuck, I wish mm-hmm. not even, I wish I do have time. I just a lot it to do no, very acidic things, which isn't a bad thing. I mean, it's all balance, right? There's going to be ups and downs, ebbs and flows, right? There's discipline, right? Things won't change unless we have discipline. So yeah. And that's a practice in itself. There's that was oh, what, crazy. Uh, what nature called for. That's what the, what life called for at that point, right? Yeah. Whether it was the architects of this realm or I finally just said, fuck it and decide to change my mind on my own through free will, which a lot of people will debate anyways, but doesn't matter. It happened. So mm-hmm. yeah, no, it's, it's mainly been, uh, yeah, just trying to recall and then going back. And like, if I remember a quote, I'll be like, okay, is that actually what I remembered and looked it up real quick and it's there. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And, um, we're definitely going to have to do more podcasts on this topic. I think that this is kind of a catch up episode and kind of an introduction to these topics. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's how it's going to go. But you're talking about, uh, the external savior. And I think what, what Robert Bly, young Freud and all the mystery schools, of the past, are really pointing at is to make this mythological scape within ourselves come alive. This uh, young would call it the archetypes. Um, the ancient would call them the gods. They are absolutely sovereign upon themselves. They are alive within this mythological dream time. Um, and we we change by coming within proximity to their resonance. And uh, Robert Bly, when I went back and listened, he said something brilliant, that the boy becomes a man by close proximity, magnetic resonance to the wild man. And I thought that was brilliant. It's something that I overlooked uh, the first or second time that I listened. And then when we went back this week and listened to it again, it's it's exactly that. It's that, that these these archetypal forces we we need to build a relationship with them we need to uh consult them we need to visit their world in a sense and and that's where just by sheer proximity of these of these god forces it's going to it's going to change us um it's like alchemy as well like if you uh just on if you put something on the stove if you put soup on the stove and the stove is hot the soup becomes hot. And I think that a lot of these primal forces uh, act in the same way that you get close to them. You, you're going to be changed, I think. And uh, the wild man archetype, going back and listening, I realize what he's talking about is, is CERN and, and uh, a lot of other gods. I would even say Odin. As, as an archetype or a god is that as well um so how and do i you... didn't Sorry, i didn't realize oh, oh no i just yeah I, I didn't realize that going through the first time but now now i see that and he he does say that at the end of the book um it's kind of this this primal hunter shaman man and that's what basically all ancient civilizations had as, as the key father figure was basically a hunter shaman wild man. Right. Yeah, no, this book, uh, iron John by Robert Bly was instrumental in these times. Mm-hmm. We're producing a whole shit ton of boys and no men. So pick it up audio, uh, audible fucking Amazon. I don't care how you get it. Just get, Iron John by Robert Bly. Men and women, it's mainly a book for men. But if you're a new parent, somebody looking to have children, a mother who has young boys, definitely a perfect book to be uh, reading. But you mentioned the close proximity magnetosphere with the wild man. 
Is that what you mentioned? Magnetic resonance. Magnetic resonance. That resonance. That's it. So w- w- what? How do you take that? Like, the boy becomes a man through that process. What? W- what would that look like to you? Because I think each path is different. I think everybody, it's, right? Yeah, I think that you have to fall into the wound, and he talks about this as well. You need to drift. The wound is actually the the entry point into the heart field. And I think that we have a tendency to run from fear, to run from pain, and just keep it out of sight, out of mind. We distract ourselves, blah, blah, blah. We, I mean, everybody knows this. Maybe not everybody, but I think that actually you need to – it's kind of like the, the eye of a hurricane. If you're on the proximity – you know, there's a storm. It's generally pretty stormy and things like, you know, there's an annoyance. But to get to the heart of the wound and get into this chamber of the wild man, you have to picture yourself on, a, on an ocean and you have a boat. You need to drive right into the fucking storm. Like you really do need to just enter into that pain fully Um and and amplify the fear actually i th- i think that the new age just shames fear i'm not saying that fear fear is a is to me is a neutral thing it's a teacher and as long as we're running from fear not running towards it that's when fear has our control but if we run towards the fear you you eventually break into the eye of the hurricane you that's that's what i would call the the um the proximity or the magnetic resonance. And that's, he said that in that book too, those words, magnetic resonance. So I think that in the initi- initiation cycles of primitive people, what we call primitive people, through all tribes, is that they would scare the shit out of the boys. It wasn't fucking, oh, you're 13, like, let's go eat a cake. And, uh, you know, I'm going to show you how to fish. I mean, you did learn how to fish, but it was. You're taken by the men with masks. The men represented gods, essentially. Um, a lot of times, psychoactive compounds were used. You were kept up for two, three days in a row. So you're, um, you know, you start hallucinating. Uh, the, there was a breakdown between the conscious and the subconscious mind. So you would have more, you'd be more impressionable. And during these initiation rituals, fear was amplified at such such a fever pitch. And the only way to match that fever pitch of fear was to overcome it. And that's that's where you're pulling out the inner resources is is to grow. Because you need to, in order to grow beyond that fear, you actually need to become something different. And that's where growth comes from. So as long as we're pushing fear to the side, we're never going to grow. We actually need to match fear's intensity. And then you push through it, and then you enter into the eye of the storm, and that's kind of this uh, this dimension of change, dimension of growth. You become the storm, in a sense. And I think this is what male initiation was. It's what we're lacking now, especially. This day and age, we're taught to just shrink in fear. Fear is not good. Oh, you, you, have, you have anxiety. Here's some Prozac or whatever the fuck they give these fucking people. The fucking nonsense. And it's cutting off the body. It's cutting off the response. And we just have a, a population that's so numbed out from fear, they can't shudder like they talk about in this book. Nothing upsets them. They're just Prozac smiled out. And this giant fucking behemoth of fear is growing and growing out of our conscious perception. And this is what's going on is that this, if you want to call it the, the dark mother or... Uh, the Leviathan or the fucking Godzilla. There's so many mythologies of this. We've looked away from this monstrosity and it's just growing and growing and people are numbing themselves out and the bigger it grows, the more distractions you need, the bigger it grows, the more pills you need, the more this, the more that, until eventually you can't run from it anymore and there has to be a showdown, right? And this is this is where Thor comes in as well. This is where Jormungandr's strangling, strangling, and then eventually the heart, Thor represents this electric heart charge, awakens and kind of faces this, uh, this energy of fear. And so this is, um, this is how I think that this is accessed, is by 
amplifying fear and then facing it. Now, would that be fear of a disconnection of the mother? Because that is, from my findings anyways, that was the whole reason people are the way they are right now, right? The male initiation was to disconnect the young boy from the mother properly. So I think possibly that fear that you're talking about could be wrong. Would be some sort of fear of the, the mother. Right? There's that. Yeah. Right. So yeah. in, in Iron John, he was talking about the, uh, like they were snatched away from the mother's compound. Yeah, they were. Yeah. Right? I think and generally were, the. Oh, go ahead. No, keep going. I think generally fear, all fear is fear of the self in the, in the end. I think that that's what it is. I think that we have so much potencies within ourselves, so much potencies within the earth, the universe. Um, and the, they're gate kept actually. I think that, that we, we gate keep ourselves, uh, by a good design because you know, imagine you have the nuclear missile codes and you give it to some, uh, who knows some psycho or, or even just Biden or who the hell knows, right? You give, you give the missile codes to the wrong person. He can't handle that energy. So I think that the initiation process is the gradual process of handling more and more primal currents of energy. And it's not all in one shot. Um, I think that that's a misconception that you just go through one initiation and then you're over and then it's over in the Aborigine societies. There was a one in, primal initiation to separate from the mother but then after that you're in the male world and you could take on as much initiations as you wanted actually this is they they had that choice that you could uh prolong the period of getting married and just focus on initiations and some of these men would do that for 20 30 years they wouldn't get married uh and they would just learn more and more of the secrets um so it's this never ending depth i believe and we're afraid of the depth and in, in the modern psyche is, I think, very, very afraid of the depth and what lurks below. And since we we pushed these depths away, it creeps out into the public consciousness in unconscious ways. Like you just open up the fucking news or the X app or the Twitter app. A lot of, a lot of atrocity going on, right? That's the unconsciousness creeping out in uncontrolled ways. Yeah, that's basically where, uh, you know, the whole point of getting this book is to stop all this nonsense. You know, way back when these initiations happened for a reason, there wasn't some goofy tale to tell your kids at night. It wasn't some mythical storytelling just for shits and giggles. It was to stop the propagation of psychopathy. Yes. Right. This yes. this psychopathy. That's, that's that, exactly it. That's exactly it. Because I think that men, women are more in, intuitive and they can feel a lot easier. With men, you need almost like a fucking uh, a spear through the heart. You need to be wounded because that opens up the feeling. Metaphorically speaking, I'm not saying go lance yourself. It's probably not a good idea. You won't be around the next day <laughs> well i mean we're still doing it nowadays right we're still going through that initiation by tattooing ourselves piercing ourselves um some people who are actually in psychological need of help cut right they actually cut themselves that's a form of scarification which is an outward manifestation of an inner turmoil something that's right. not being dealt with right so that's basically a self-initiation um, exactly yeah yeah, you can see and, it everywhere. And think of think of Odin as well. He he lanced himself. He died upon his own spear so he could gain more knowledge, more wisdom. Not just knowledge, gain wisdom. And and I think that that is the male spiritual quest. Odin as the ultimate archetype, ultimate god. 
uh, essentially, this story of how he gains wisdom and how he grows is through self-sacrifice. And I think that the male world is missing that. It, it, it's, uh, I mean, yeah, some people talk about it, but on a superficial level, I, I don't think that this deep, dark, even mysticism, because that's what the masculine spirituality is. It's deep and dark. It's underneath the fucking well. It's not up in the goddamn fucking clouds. It's fucking deep within. And the way to get there is to puncture. Because we, we build these walls. We, we always build these walls. And they solidify. They solidify over time. We get comfortable. Comfort is the fucking uh, the death sentence for a man, actually. Absolute fucking death sentence. So we need, to, we need something to just pierce, lance through. So we can sneak through into that feeling world again, again and again and again. It's not just a one-time thing. Um, so I think that bringing this sacrificial, odinic, wild man sort of spirituality back is absolutely what is necessary in the Western world. The hardest part about this is nobody knows what the fuck to do. You can buy one in a million books on dealing with trauma, dealing with this and that, male initiation, but nobody's doing it. The elders, and I keep squawking at this, the fucking old men in this society are failing. Huge. Especially the boomer class. Now everybody always up in arms about the boomers. Oh my God, this and that, blah, 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 whatever. Nobody's initiating the young. I think the only person that I can kind of do a a connection with that I can see initiating people, he does both men and women, is Wim Hof. And this guy, it's not through the traditional wounding, right? James mentioned the, the wounding initiatory rites of the Aboriginal, which actually still happens today. The Dogon, there's a whole bunch of people in Africa and you know, sub-Saharan Africa that are still doing these initiatory rites. Nobody's doing it today. So again, we can talk and talk and talk and explain what to do and this and that, but really when it comes down to it, it's things are always passed down through generational means. So when you split that, you got a hundred, 200, 300 years of nobody doing anything for the youth. And then this information comes back. It's real fucking hard to get it started again. I mean, no, that I know of anyways, I'm speaking generalities for all I know. There are old, you know, 67 year old grandparents taking their grandchildren out to the bush and uh, teaching them how to hunt and about the masculine properties of being a man, the loving aspect of the masculine, not just the savagery, you know, Mm -hmm. when that child, you know, gets a deer, tags a deer, and that, that child's blooded in with the blood of that deer. And he's told about the spirit of the deer and he's told about why it's good to, um, you know, forge your own food and why you need to be doing this for yourself and not to depend on anybody else. I'm sure that's happening, but few and far between. So reading these books like Iron John, reading the fairy stories, reading um, about psychology, isn't the most fun. You're not going to be super excited. You're not going to be gung ho, full of energy. Like, fuck yeah, Carl Jung, the black books. Oh my God. But if you want to stop doing things that you don't want to do anymore and figure out how to teach your children, figure out how to teach your grandchildren, figure out how to be a proper male figure in somebody's life, how to be a proper uh, feminine figure in somebody's life, you need to start learning this stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. So all the fanciful, super ego spiritual shit is just going to cloud. It muddies the water of the true nature of what people should be doing. And sometimes it's not good to say you should be doing this because people just get hung up on how the fuck dare you? What do you mean? How are you telling me what to do? I hear it all the time and I see it. When you see people acting out because of deep seated trauma that I'm sure they're fucking aware of. And they make it known to people. It's like, you need to fix that. 
because then yeah. they constantly complain and complain and complain about the same shit as a revolution going on in their life. But it's that inner war that they're fighting and it manifests outside. You ever seen that person in line, just an absolute dick. I mean, an absolute piece of shit to a barista at a Starbucks or Tim Hortons or whatever fucking coffee shops in your local area. And you look at them, you're like, how could you be so mean for absolutely no fucking reason? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. It's it's because. because, Yeah. It's inner turmoil. It's it, you know, it's inner warfare that's going on, but these people won't deal with it. So it's brought outwards. Now let's blow that up to a collective scale. Like James said, look at the news, open up Twitter, you know, whatever you got to do to get your information and you see, and you're just like, holy fuck, instant black pill. You're like, we're fucked. We're doomed. Yeah. I don't think it's we're because fucked of this doomed. stuff. No, not at all. I'm not saying we're doomed either, but I mean, the human race is going to do what the fucking human race does. Right. But it it's does need a, learn. a collective transformation. Yeah. Yeah. On a singular level, on, on a singular level, nothing collective can be without each individual human being choosing to do something. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point of a collective consciousness is it's each individual human being either negating, suppressing, repressing, or choosing to go through something. Like you said, the storm, go full fucking head first into the storm, figure it out and hope you come out alive on the other end. Mm -hmm. And then boom, you know, just however the hermetics, you know, the hermetic uh, teachers would say it would, you know, It'll explode into the consciousness collectively. Everybody will change. The vibration of the earth will 5D ascend into whatever the fuck Valhalla, right? Whatever you, whatever you want to call it, but it needs to be done on an individual level. That means each child, right? This is what we're talking about is initiation from youth. Because if not, yeah. then psychopathy, all these horrible things we're seeing will propagate and it'll grow and it'll grow and it'll grow. Mm-hmm. So that's my rant. Yeah. And it's going to take people like me and you and others to kind of reinstitute these matters back. Um, I think that this podcast is, is a great start. I know we both have further goals along this, these lines of thought, right? Um, I mean, I'm not even trying to be a, a, a segue or a, a head figure, figurehead, sorry, of doing any no, of this no, shit. No, no, no. You know, Carl Jung didn't even like going to his own institute. I think he fucking went there once. Yeah. He showed up once. He was like, nah, fuck that. I don't want anything to do with this shit. He just wrote and he wrote and he wrote until he died. And that's all he could do. Yeah. To me, yeah. it sounds a little black pilled, but I don't want to be a figurehead. I don't want my name attached to anything of that. It's people, you, you, dude, we can do a thousand episodes. Look at Mark Passio. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm not saying he's doing a bad thing or, you know, it's not working or anything like that, but like, holy fuck, you can scream and you can yell and you can throw things at people and it doesn't matter because it's going to take their own courage. I don't like using the word willpower, but courage, courage and energy, you know, libidic energy to change how the fuck they think or what to do. You know what I mean? In life. So I think it's just putting out the knowledge. That's all you can do realistically and it sounds a little black pill but you know what so be it yeah i think putting out the the knowledge i think my vision is to see some of these ancient initiation practices brought back on, at some level in person um we're at a time and place realistically where it's it's self initiation and it takes a lot of research and a lot of experimentation to get through these things and you don't even there's there are maps but you don't know that there even is maps until later it's it's very strange it is um, right in iron john he speaks about the uh, the boy not going back to the 
courtyard, the castle courtyard, and looking at the uh, or asking for his golden ball back until you know thirty five, mm. the age of thirty five, right? And he said most people won't even go back to that wild man and ask for it. They'll just spend the rest of their lives hoping and asking the wrong people, asking their wife to give them back their golden ball. And you may not, listeners, you may not get exactly what I'm talking about until you read the book, but the golden ball, um, yeah, without giving too much of a spoiler away, but asking all the wrong people, asking your mother back for the golden ball, asking your wife, asking your children, asking your you know business partner, whatever it may be, for something that is yours and yours alone to find. So asking, yeah, no, asking anything, asking the video game, asking, uh, exactly. Really? Yeah. It, it does. You need to, like he says in the book or in the, in the original fairy tale, you need to just grab a, grab a bucket and, and get this guy out essentially. I mean, he did come out, and then I think the the king kind of kept him in, in the cage. Um, but asking for that key back, like we can't ask the mother for the key for our wildness. You can't ask anybody else for for your own wildness. You can't ask. You you can't. Nobody else can gain you permission. Is kind of what the key uh, point to that is, is that. No one's going to grant you permission to be sovereign, to be wild, not not wild in the sense of a of a savage man, like with a club going around, but just not caring spirit. what other people think, right? Yeah, having yeah. long hair. It was it was connected to long hair, right? The sexual energy of a man, right? In the tribes, the guy with the biggest, you know longest hair and all uh, so on and so forth. Right. It was depending on which continent we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was just being a wild man. I think it's even in the name, not a tame sanitized man, a wild man saying what needs to be said. The word, no, the word, no, you know what I mean? Like just mm-hmm. a simple two letter word can make you a wild man when it's used properly. Just intensely present as well intensely present with whatever's happening and that's where the this sort of shamanistic aspect comes in cuz he was also connected if you look at cern the um the irish deity he was also connected to the all the animals and uh and the forest he he is the male aspect of nature he is the male embodiment of nature he is nature embodied essentially and even nature has been has been so feminized as well and iron johnny talks about that that these ideas of what's masculine and feminine they flip and they're both they they dance back and forth even in the nordic myth the sun was feminine and the moon was masculine so you, you see that these just because it says so in your freemason handbook or whatever doesn't mean that that's actually what it is as soon as you real as soon as you believe the interpretation or you believe the symbol is the actual reality i think that that's where you get trapped and a lot of these mystery schools are in that trap where well it says so in this book so that's just the way it is is right? that what it says in your free freemason handbook too or is that only mine i got version two i'm on uh yeah, thirty at the thirty second level when I took my initiation. Gotcha, uh, cool. Okay. Oh shit! I think we're giving too much. <laughs> Are we still live? <laughs> no, but <laughs> no, but I I agree with we'll, wanting we'll to see. <laughs> no, that's fine. I don't care. <laughs> Northern Andrew is a fed. Anyways, that's that's for all the people who are like, I'm gonna block this guy. Yeah, but seeing these. Um, initiations come back into reality in what are we in the 22nd century now 21st century still that's how much i'm disconnected but, is, man. All right, yeah anyways this day and age right now to come back would be tough because people are androgynous they don't even understand where their heritage their bloodline i'm canadian i'm american 
It's like, okay, but your bloodline started somewhere, right? So it's getting back to that root because teaching like a, in the book, he speaks about um, the Aborigines. Oh man. Basically where they knocked out his tooth. The, the first man, which was Adam. Looked up in the tree. They're like, oh, there's Adam right there when they brought all the children in. And then they would strategically knock out a tooth of each child, each boy. And then that would connect their minds to the first man. Every single time they felt that gap, they felt Mm -hmm. intrinsically connected to the first man, which was, you know, quote unquote, Adam in Christian mythology. Would you be teaching that to somebody from, you know, Northern Europe lineage? Maybe it would work if it was adapted. No, no. To me, that's kind of a hurdle. That's something to jump through is like, if you're going to be teaching young boys of all ages or sorry, of all uh, lineages and shit like that. And this androgynous North American, you know, FEMA camp that we're living in. It's really, that's why it has to be done um, by the family. It has to be done. You know what I mean? By the grandfather for fuck's sakes. So teaching other things, like I've got it in my mind. I'm going to make enough money to make, um, I'd really like to start. And I'm going to is an Institute for men. Right. There's been men's groups. There was a men's movement by Robert Moore, Robert Bly, all these guys, uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s, where it was about healing trauma. Right. And I like that aspect of it. And again, I wasn't there. I've never seen them. I haven't seen videos. I don't know anybody who was a part of them. So I don't know if there was a physical aspect to these, these uh, men's movement institutes. There was. Yeah. They, uh, they have a channel on YouTube. It- it was called the the Minnesota Men's Conference. I think I've, we've shared some videos, yeah. yeah. But they they would meet once a week, and I think that that is necessary too. Male yeah, holding a space only spaces, for men. female only spaces. Um, holding a space for men and men only. Yeah, that's uh, what I mean. That's it yeah. would almost be inviting the family, right? The father, grandfather, and son to learn. Everything, you know, whatever I I posted about it on Twitter, just, you know, learning to forge, learning to hunt, learning, you know, getting your gun license so you can shoot. So you could, you know, not be a fucking pussy and be afraid of weaponry, which Freud would call a, uh, what did he say? It was the fear of weapons is a sec, a retarded sexual degeneration of the mind or something like that. Loose quote. I know a lot of men today that you say the word gun and they're like, oh my God, how dare you? What do you need that for? And I'm just like, fear of the fuck. Jesus Christ. Instant end of conversation when I'm having conversations with people and they're like, a gun? What do you mean? And I'm like, nope. And just fucking walk off, have a smoke outside. But inviting the generational family to come learn all these things. And then from there, maybe they get interested in, okay, fuck it. Let's trace our lineage back. Let's learn more about our history. Then they can start teaching their own children, you know, the father, the son, the grandfather the male Trinity, the real masculine Trinity right there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then eventually who knows, maybe they come across their own initiatory myths, stories, right. And they start teaching it, but yeah, that's what uh, my Institute for men would be, you know, Sounds riding cool. ATVs, archery, all the real hands-on shit, learn how to do your own fucking plumbing for God's sakes. People, you could save thousands of dollars. Just throwing it out there. Yeah, no, it's it's desperately needed. Desperately needed. And you were talking about the, the lineage factor. Like that's what the gods actually are, is I call it the ancestral root god. And we all have one. Every race tribe, culture. It's going to differ because we're different, right? There's different myths. Uh, The Nordic myths of the mountains and volcanic activity and, and fire and water and chaotic elements of nature and snow 
has absolutely no bearing in the jungle or the desert. It's like taking, this is what Christianity, this is what well, essentially Abrahamism has done, is that they just paved over the entire earth and said, all that stuff doesn't matter. The land doesn't matter. The people don't matter. Your myths don't matter. Your language doesn't matter. None of it fucking matters. All that matters is our own tribal deity, <coughs> Jehovah. And take, for example, the Inuit. I don't know any Inuit myths, but I'm fairly certain there's got to be polar bears within their local mythology. A lot of ice. Yeah, and now if you were to take a polar bear deity and try to convert people in the Amazon, it's not going to happen. Everything is localized. So we do need this connection to the land, connection to the ancestry, connection to the roots in order to really tap into this. Um, Imagining figures of Jesus, it's not going to get you very far at all. I think it'll probably just do more damage because then you're imagining false figures of light. As Carl Jung said, we do not... I think he said something about imagining false figures of light, and I think that that is what the spirituality has become, is that we're operating from this wounded standpoint, imagining an escape. And then from this wounded standpoint, rather than investigating the wound, we stand on the surface level and then imagine figures of light to come and save us from our perceived imprisonment. I mean, that's Gnosticism 101. The opposite approach and the more ancient approach was not to imagine figures of light above. It was to stand and go downwards. And then you find the light within the darkness. You don't find the light by imagining it with your third eye. I mean, you you will get those experiences with the third eye and and things like that opening. Um, But it was more about going into the darkness. And within the the midst of the darkness, the the light sort of appears, right? Um, And that's that's ancient spirituality. Um, This is big time paraphrasing and kind of glossing over things but this is this is what i think is missing completely in the spirituality of the west is that everybody just wants to feel good it's become a hedonistic thing and uh it's almost like prozac it's like spiritual prozac just read a few hymns from the indian guru and you're all set there you know all is an illusion and only is love that is true from a certain standpoint but is it true right now? Like uh, We need to deal with all layers of reality. Is it true when you have gaping traumatic wounds underneath the surface and you're trying to escape them? Imagining this does not help. What actually does help is going in deeply into the pain. And uh, this is what Iron John talks about as well. Yeah, there's actually a quote. You mentioned uh, Jehovah or you know, the Christian... Uh, aspect of just kind of that they're they're pacifying people but this is from uh michael tesserion's dragon mother website he wrote an article it's say no to psychology it says the religious man is an open book or so he thinks he conjures jesus or some other deity or demigod who sees into his heart his imperfections are known and their remedies prefabricated just read the instructions get into lockstep with others in the same mass and wait for the external authority to give you the rubber stamp of approval. All the while, one fails to face their constitutional infantilism. There's no need Mm. to query whether Jesus or God have pathological or psychological profiles of their own. And he goes on to say, one glance at the Old Testament tells us that Jehovah has supersized hangups and phobias, causing pathological behavior most of the time. But again, where there is theology, there's no need for psychology. Amazing. It's brilliant, yeah. You could almost say that Jehovah is actually a projection of the people itself. Oh, it's unbelievable. Well. Yeah. Reading the, As, the the Hiram key, they were talking about how nobody, I mean, this is for a completely different topic, but like nobody liked Jehovah. You know what I mean? <laughs> the original, when they were carrying him around and shit, it was, it was, it's amazing how much it's been uh, deified. It's crazy, but really, it was like a 33rd on the fucking chain of deities that they were worshiping at the time. 
Hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that the roots of communism and Tassarian and other people get into this. The the roots of communism is Judeo Christianity in its collectivized form, not the mystery traditions of the Essenes and kind of the, the, uh, the mystery tradition, Christianity, things like that. But this collectivized form is, uh, is spiritual communism. And then we're witnessing the end product of, of Abrahamism right now. They're, everybody's the same. The, these ideas that, uh, you know, there are no races, there are no special lands, uh, everybody's the same, everybody's equal. These have their roots right there in those religions. You know, it's fucking wild, man. Yeah, absolutely. So we're coming up to the top of the hour. I think uh, it's a good summary of, you know, what we've been doing where we're going to be going and uh, where we're going to be trying to accomplish. What do you think? Yeah, I think so too. Um, I believe that absolutely we'll have to go through the fairy tale itself on the next episode. And this will kind of be a, a continual sort of topic um, it's been a long time, so we did do a lot of catch up and, uh, we're kind of ranting, not ranting, but. Oh, I love it. Just I love expressing, it. Just, expressing yeah. it. It's kind of off, off the cuff podcast episode to kind of break back into everything. Going to be bringing you guys a lot more content and, uh, really getting into my avenue anyways is male initiation psychology and why everybody's running the fuck away from it. Yeah. What do you got on your docket, James? I think it all interlinks, but definitely that um, mythology But mythology is the mystery system, which is the psychology system. Uh, The connection to the land, the megalithic sites, we really got deep into that, the science of it. We're going to have an episode with somebody to speak about Velikovsky and kind of the ancient primal earth coming up pretty soon. Um, Same sort of threads. I feel like since the last time we did an episode that between then and now there's uh, a lot of content and a lot of stuff that we've been uh, sharing online and it'll be great to put it into more of a formal content and as presentation so looking forward to, to keep going with this definitely and with that we're wrapping up episode 10 everyone there's northernwolvespodcast.com there's the telegram group Uh, you can follow James on Twitter and me we also have the podcast uh, profile which is uh, Northern Wolves Podcast so just look it up on Twitter and you can find all our episodes same thing with YouTube we'll link everything below and especially the book Iron John by Robert Bly must read absolute arsenal a weapon you definitely want in your arsenal <laughs>